it's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation for the presentation. Um, this uh, paper is uh, uh, the beginnings of thinking about uh, a, a broader vision of women education and empire in France compared to what I did most recently, uh, which is this book, which was a biography. So I'm really struggling with moving from the kind of fascination with biography that I uh, discovered uh, and trying to, to make bigger arguments, but you're going to see that I'm going to remain on a very small scale here. Um, I'm going to explore today both written and iconac iconac iconographic, iconographic sorry, sources that uh, represent educational spaces for indigenous girls uh, established by the French in North Africa and mostly Algeria, you'll see. And my interest is in seeing how these discourses surrounding girls' schools uh, schooling and schooling practice is changes from the mid 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. And I'm making an attempt here also to render very visible the spaces that are being talked about and, uh, and debated. So in uh, line with this interest in the visual, I'm going to begin with a series of three photographs taken in the 1850s in uh, Algeria as a way of establishing a sort of visual grammar about women's role in the civilizing mission. So I'm going to put this up, the first of these pictures up for a while. Came across these photographs while studying Eugenie Luce's uh, School for Muslim Girls, which was established in Algeria in 1845 and lasted as a school until 1861. Uh, the photographs, uh, and this is the first, uh, depict three moments in the school day. They're all staged, of course, uh, given that this is taken in 1857, so we're really at the early days of photography. But they're clearly intended to speak about what the French state and the French state's agent, Madame Luce, uh, the imposing woman in the background, was seeking to accomplish in her school. These images show that the French took seriously, at this moment, women's role in the civilizing mission, enough to encourage one of the first official photographers to travel around Algeria to take pictures of the school. The photographs also offer insight into the characteristics of the civilizing mission and the weight of a Western modernizing uh, perspective. Here in this first instance, this is where you really see it as a school, although of course um, not a very natural arrangement of the school. It's a mutual school, which you can tell from the older student next to the, to, next to the blackboard. You see the girls are wearing shoes. Uh, they're being taught school subjects. Uh, what's written on the blackboard is le principe, le principe de la sagesse et la crainte de Dieu. So they're learning French. They're learning how to write in French. And they're being given a good moralizing topic as, as well. Uh, you, these are clearly schooled bodies within this, uh, within this setting. Uh, they're sitting on a bench, although we don't see the, the, the bench. The bodies, however, are of different ethnic origins. Testimony, I would argue, to the generosity of the French civilizing mission, um, taking in varieties of, of uh, girls. The educational modernity then is further on show in the second of the photos, where you see a, a, a male, a school inspector. Uh, so not only are the girls being schooled, but the, but the school itself is being accepted and inspected and uh, French are making sure that the money they're investing in the school is being well spent and uh, we can talk about the, the maps in the background and uh, look later on. The final image then brings home the very gendered and class realities of this uh, Arab French school. The lessons in French and Arabic are coupled with those in needlework, and here you see it's French women who are teaching the, the girls various types of, of embroidery, considered necessary women's work, and a particularly useful counterpoint to contemporary Orientalist representations of harem women. Here you see uh, these images are showcasing fr the French concern to transform indigenous girl students into women who would resemble lower class French women. This same image is, is reproduced in the, in the uh, weekly illustration, which would have circulated widely in French. And you see it a little better, and you also see that the map is not representing France, but uh, northern, uh, northern, northern Africa. 
This school, known as an Arab French school, was one of several created at mid-century in, in Algeria. Within the school, mostly uh, indigenous girls were being taught both French and Arabic, like in the boys' uh, Arab French schools, which existed at the same time. This term Arab French referred more to the subject matters than to a mix of student bodies, although in fact uh, in uh, the boys' and girls' schools there's evidence that French pupils were part of this experiment in what was referred to at the time as, the, as a fusion of the races. My study of Madame Luce's school revealed a quite diverse group student body, than, more diverse than one might, one might imagine. Arabs, Berbers, Negresses, as they said, Jews, as well as a few French girls, including Luce's granddaughter, who would continue her grandmother's educational project with a different twist, as I'll show you. Madame Luce's school was very much a part of the Algerian educational experiment at mid-century, supported by other St. Simonians uh, like herself within the colonial administration. Re represents a moment in the French colonial project when girls and women were considered part of the civilizing mission, thanks to Luce's insistence, under the premise that if the state failed to rally women to the French cause, they would nourish hatred of the French within families. So you need to get women on board. The goal then was to teach these girls to speak French, to adopt a French work ethic, as well as hygienic practices, and then to marry to spread these values more broadly. One sees obvious parallels here with later French Republican politics that Weber summarized in his book, Peasants into, into Frenchment. We have evidence here of how the French sought to transform Arab girls into civilized female subjects. And the French were really very proud of their initiative, as was evident by the way they showcased uh, these Arab French schools within universal exhibitions, and particularly this uh, girls' school. Um, objects from the, from the colonial girls' school were present from the very first French universal exhibition in 1855. Within the exhibit of the Ministry of War, embroideries from Madame Luce's school attracted particular attention, as this extract from the Luce Passion shows. And so, here you see em uh, emphasis on the fact that the school has already existed for 10 years, so it's not just been a little blip in the colonial moment. Several generations of girls have gone, that there's over 150 students, the mixture of, uh, of students, Arabs, Kabyles, Negresses, etc. Um, and, uh, and the quote, and, and it emphasizes as well at the, in this quotation that you know, she's teaching these little girls how to speak French, and they're learning with incredible uh, r rapidity and you know, emphasis on their intelligence and their ability to learn all different sorts of topics. The quotation then continues and goes on to encourage French readers to, to go and buy the products that are being produced within the school by the, by the students, and that this is then a way for the French to con add this charitable dimension to the support of the school because the money then will be given to the students who themselves are mostly poor. Uh, it, is, uh, it is emphasized. This experiment in Arab French girls' schooling didn't survive, however, changes in colonial politics that by the early 1860s gave a somewhat greater voice to Arab notables who were violently opposed to uh, Arab girls' education. And so for several decades, this uh, you know, educational laboratory, in a sense, closed down, especially for girls and especially once the settler population came to power. Uh, the boys' Arab French schools would have a sort of peak of success in the 1860s, but would also disappear as well. So what I'd like to do now is to see what happens to the, fr the French interest in edu educating North African girls in the early decades of the Third Republic as the empire expanded, uh, notably with the establishment of the protectorate in Tunisia in 1881. And I'll be looking at representations of girls' schooling that circulated within the context of an emerging tourist economy within North Africa associated with the success of these world fairs or colonial exhibitions. In Algeria, interest in promoting indigenous girls' schooling only reemerges in the 1890s. But at this point, the emphasis on Arab French schooling has disappeared. Only a few indigenous students had found their way into French uh, schools, and the French, the effect of the Republican educational reforms in Algeria was to create a separate and quite unequal uh, network of schools. So that the sort of cultural generosity that uh, saw the need to bring French to indigenous girls uh, in, at mid-century had for the most part vanished, and in its place the state encourages the creation of uh, école ouvrage, or school workshops, 
um, in which the emphasis is on the working and on vocational tra training. Girls probably learn the rudiments of Arabic in order to stitch names into embroideries, for instance, as well as moral lessons, which would have been accompanied uh, these, these lessons. But there was no longer any pretense at teaching French. And Madame Luce's school was transformed into one such institution. You have the White Sisters, for example, and uh, were very active in Kabylia, who were running lots of these sorts of schools by the end of the end of the 19th century. So what I'd like to do here is to look at public representations of these institutions in an effort to decode what I've termed a grammar of schooling with respect to indigenous girls in Algeria before turning to Tunisia and questioning how this grammar was reworked in part given the Algerian experience. So in my book, I looked at these shifting public representations of Madame Luce's school within the press, colonial affairs, universal exhibitions. From her initial presence in 1855 up until the early 20th century, the school workshop disappears just before World War I. By 1870, the 1878 Universal and ex Exhibition in Paris, it's the granddaughter who was raised in the school, Henriette Benaben, who's the principal actress behind the scenes. Uh, she's the one who fashioned the school's reorientation toward becoming what was termed uh, as, uh, in uh, école de broderie or an école ouvrage. And it's images of her institution that are going to circulate quite widely at the turn of the century, in part because of a relationship she has with a, a French photographer uh, in, uh, in Algeria. Above all, however, I'd like to argue that she and a number of, of other colonial women in Algeria are going to seize the opportunities available at the turn of the century to place girls' training more than instruction in the public eye. To this extent, then they're going to take advantage of this burgeoning interest in ethnography, artisanal trades, and artisanal arts, which is going to allow them to um, attract attention to their institutions. Because Ben Aben wel welcomed visitors and photographers into her uh, institution, we have both descriptions and photographs that illustrate the extent to which primary schooling in the rudiments had ceased to be a priority by the turn of the century. I first want to sort of position uh, uh, this institution, and this is uh, you. I don't have to be near, um, the the different streets are the different location earlier in the century where the school was located. By the 1880s, the school's located in the lower Kasbah, where there's a good deal of um, of uh, mixing of both uh, indigenous and French or European populations. Uh, what uh, here? Um, and then uh, uh, Ben Aben will move her school to a larger location on the edge of the Casbah on the Rue du Rampère Médé, and finally open up at the turn of the century on the Rue Marango, uh, a place where she can sell the products of the workshop. And the British, the Brits are very much, and, and the tourists um, are very much settled at the at the top of uh, of this city at this at this point in time. Um, she, it's become a place where girls are being taught embroidering, but also where older women can come and have access to the material which allows them to, to create embroideries that they can then, then sell. In addition to training girls, Beneben is also active at this point in promoting the female indigenous arts, collecting pre-colonial patterns from which she taught. Between 1890 and 1910, she not only participates in universal exhibitions and local trade shares, but she also contributes to the first Muslim art exhibitions uh, in Algiers. 1905, alongside the International Congress of Orient Orientalists, which is organized in the Madrasa of Algiers, she uh, donates objects from her school and from her collection that are part of this, of this exhibit as a way of highlighting the fact that women alongside men are you know, the artisans of this Muslim art and working of recognition. So I'd like to use, once again, sort of a series of images of, of her institution uh, to look at what's happening at the turn of the century. So this is one image to um, uh, so try to keep in mind what you've seen, what you've seen earlier. Madame uh, Henriette Benaben is, uh, is Ooh, you don't see that very well. It's too bad because it's a rather it's colorized. Uh, um, is this woman here? Her here in the corner. What's striking compared to earlier images is the presence of a of a of a veiled woman. You're clearly not in a school here. You're in a, a workshop where girls are learning how to in, embroider, sitting on the ground with little hand looms um, with the um, metier tissé. 
which are, have, have been clearly cre been created uh, for them. This is image, however, doesn't circulate as widely as this postcard, which is made of the institution. And I think it's interesting to uh, realize associated with perhaps better known uh, postcards of exotic women in various stages of undress that you also have postcards of uh, little uh, Algerian girls uh, working. And I think it's interesting here that no presence of European women uh, in, the, in, the, in the frame. And interesting as well to notice that uh, Henriette Ben Aben, who does not, it was not married to uh, uh, Monsieur Ben Aben, and the name is in fact, there's no hyphen, but she's clearly trying to suggest that there's a form of cultural proximity, uh, if not to suggest that she is herself uh, uh, of, of indigenous or origins. And it, there's a specification of where it's located, uh, you see uh, up at the top there. Uh, across from the mosque. I mean, it's, these are clearly efforts to um, uh, inscribe the institution in a local native culture, very different from what we saw in the earlier image. And here, the same uh, uh, postcard is colorized in these images. It's also, um, I think this is, this is on the cover of my book, I think it's a really lovely, lovely image. <laughs> uh, so, um, this, however, is a, a, an image I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about. It comes from the World Fair in uh, 1893, and it's the only one about which I have an archival substrata that allows me to cover part of the story of what's going on here. Um, so uh, it, this is uh, 1893, the Woman's Palace, the Universal Exhibition for the Chicago World Fair, and you see um, zoom in a little more that it's uh, hangings embroidered in the school of Madame Luce uh, Ben Aben and we keep the hyphen that doesn't really exist as well as I believe I found this uh, uh, in, uh, textile um, which indicates Madame Luce Ben Aben you see she's taken on the name of her grandmother um, and it, there's no sign of a school anymore but we do have a little girl uh, learning uh, to, to do this embroidery. In the correspondence with the woman who organized the women's the, the presence of uh, women's work in the World Fair, um, there's a letter from Ben Aben to Potter Palmer, written in what she describes as her bad English, in which she's saying, "What would you like for me to send to you?" Um, and she, but she says, "Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to be able to send to represent what is being done by women, because aside from herself, nobody's very interested in the miserable state of Moorish women." or who they seem very afflicted by the sight of these children wandering in the streets. So she says, I'll be your correspondent, I can send you stuff. And she goes on and says, uh, I can't go myself, but what might you like, what would you like me to send you? Uh, a Moorish interior, uh, uh, or I could send you photos of my grandmother's first establishment before it was by the expropriation of the building for the opening of some new large streets. And then she criticizes the French colonial colonial urbanism. Um, then she discovers that her objects have not been sent to the Women's Palace, and there's a letter in July, very irate, uh, saying, you know, I gave uh, these objects uh, to uh, the French committee, uh, produced by young and old from 12 years to 75, with the express condition and under strict promise that they should be exhibited at the Ladies' Palace. And now I hear they're at the Algerian Pavilion and the Agricultural po po Palace. I protest against this behavior of the French committee, and I would be so grateful if you kindly tell me what is to be done in such an event. Now, I'm assuming that she was able to move uh, Bertha, uh, Bertha Potter Palmer to get her objects into the women's building because the image I showed you is included in a, an American uh, book about women's art in the, uh, in the, in the women's palace. Um, I think, though, what is so interesting about this is you have a sense of what she's hoping to accomplish uh, by presenting these objects. And you see that she clearly wants to represent, put this next to other works by women, and she sees this as an important part of her project. By 1900, the feminist nature of her enterprise was recognized in the uh, World Fair that took place in Paris. Organization of, a, of an international feminist con congress describes in its only description of colonial schools 
we have a description of uh, Ben Aben's Professional Embroidery School for Young Arab Women, which describes it as political, humanitarian, and artistic. Um, and you see in this um, quotation that schooling has really, is really not present at all. It is learning a skill which will give girls money, pull them out of misery, but also resurrect the masterpieces of the, of the past because these students um, elevate Muslim arts, which are tending to disappear. And this, ev this emphasis on the fact of where it's situated between the Arab and European quarters, and that it, it's a connecting link between the new two nations, but it also attracts visitors from around the world. Um, and very interesting for me, that Parisian professional schools would do well to model their initiatives after her. So, I mean, really the, pro the, 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 the colony um, is, is more in advance than uh, what's happening in, uh, in France. Uh, rather than conclude, though, that by the turn of the century, the French had, in a sense, given up on elementary instruction for Arab girls, I want to turn briefly to what was happening in the neighboring uh, protectorate of Tunisia. Now, the cultural politics in Tunisia have long been described as a response to what went wrong in Algeria, um, given settler opposition to indigenous education. Uh, so that just as the French have abandoned Arab French schooling for uh, boys in Algeria, they're going to uh, develop the same uh, in, in Tunisia, but you know, hope this time we're going to get it right. Now, while boys were the primary target of these educational initiatives, girls were not completely forgotten, as Julia Clancy Smith's scholarship has shown. So I want to look at this Arab-French school for girls that was founded in 1900 in, in, in Tunis uh, as a way of highlighting the persistence of a certain model of indigenous female schooling within the French Empire, whose origins stretched back to the ideological ferment of the saint simonian conquest of Algeria. And I also want to emphasize the role of individual teachers in fashioning this modernist Franco-Arab grammar of schooling that included girls as well in Tunis, but not in Algeria. So, uh, oops, here's my women's building. I, uh, oh, I, I do want to show you. This is the tombstone of Henriette uh, ben, ben Aben, um, just in, uh, to emphasize the fact that she's buried in the European cemetery, but in a Muslim-style uh, stone, uh, tombstone. Uh, one side in Arabic, one side in French, describing what she, what she had done. So this sort of identification with uh, uh, the, the, the culture that she describes in the written work is also goes on in, the, in stone after her death. Um, um, so the school I'm interested in is the Ecole Louise Millet, which Julia Clancy Smith has written about a, a good deal, and in 2000 described as the first academic primary school in North Africa for Muslim Arab girls, which consciously departed from the artisanal model of indigenous female education. I would say now Madame Alouise's school would have predated that by 65 years, but in 1900, this, uh, this sort of school uh, no longer existed in, in, in Algeria. Before describing the school, however, few words about the educational context that rendered its creation possible. Um, the development of Arab French schools in Tunisia was very much the product of an imperial circulation of people and ideas associated with a number of these Arab-speaking cultural intermediaries that Alain Maswadi has studied uh, in, uh, in Northern Africa. And Louis Machouel, in particular, as head of the Directeur de l'Enseignement between 1883 and 1908, pr promoted this particular form of schooling for both European and indigenous students as a way to bring the two civilizations and populations together. But he was also interested in providing competition with the missionary schools, which were already well established before the establishment of the protectorate. His vision of Arab French schooling bore a direct relationship to what had existed in Algeria, since he himself, like Henriette Ben Aben, was brought up within his father's Arab French school in Algeria. He had also attended a Muslim Qutab where he studied uh, the Quran, colloquial and classical Arabic. And when he was appointed then in 1883, he sees himself very much as an educational modernizer interested in promoting industrial, commercial, modern education for both French and Arab students. The member, founding member of the Alliance Française as well, concerned to spread both Arab and French and both populations. Not surprisingly, his first efforts are directed towards boys. Um, but uh, 
He's building uh, on an existing concern within Tunisia to promote an intellectual synthesis between modern European education and Arab Muslim cultural traditions, which is represented by this Collège Sadiqi. Um, this is the building in 1901, but it was founded in 1875 before the French uh, protectorate. In general, Louise Millet founded a school for girls that was placed under the direction of Charlotte Egenschenk, and I know I should be here finishing up. Um, it's a school that still exists today. The school was to improve the lives, intended to improve the lives of our Muslim female students and to enhance French cultural influence among the natives. But from the outset, there was a far more ambitious intellectual and social uh, objectives that include a genuine academic program um, that lasted all day, courses in classical Arabic, Islam, history, geography, French conversation, but also classes in the domestic arts, personal hygiene, puericulture, um, giving a sort of feminine cast, as would have been the case in a school in France at the same time. By 1905, Eigenschenk had over 100 pupils, and the families that sent her daughters included local elites. Like Madame uh, Luce's school 50 years earlier, the school attracted a great deal of public attention, and this is what I would like to uh, focus on at the end by looking at uh, the, um, the, the representation of the school that was given in 1907 in the same uh, illustrated weekly illustration. Um, two images then to conclude. Uh, this, this first uh, uh, image is, uh, accompanies an article that was titled Les Jouris à l'école. Um, the images, I think, speaks powerfully to the complicated ways Arab women negotiated access to learning in the early 20th century. This is the larger photo, takes up the entire page. It presents a school scene within a visibly oriental decor, which of course the article title uh, re reinforces. The girls are positioned on European school benches, which the article tells us pose problems for the girls, and uh, they describe seeing girls falling off of the benches because they're not used to sitting on them. It's a French lesson on the on the blackboard. They're learning La Fontaine, fables of La Fontaine, said to suggest the importance of language for the process of civilization. But the teacher herself is not quite French. We learn that she's in fact Greek in the article, and it's clear from the setting and the clothing that this school, like Madame Luce's before, it was careful to mingle school learning with a respect for native culture uh, in, a, in a separate space, in, in this um, uh, space. The second picture, however, um, uh, shows the difference between the inside and the outside. The girls are now veiled. We don't see the faces. And this is one of the things Julia Francis Smith tells us about the photographs she's got of the, of the schools is that you don't that the, the, the images of the faces are are, 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 are veiled. The accompanying article hesitated between presenting the school as an exotic house of fairies from the Orient while also noting the presence of hundreds of little Muslim girls who are learning to read, write, and calculate according to French methods, and that's exactly the same expressions that are used to describe Madame Luce's school in 1845. So you see the same sort of tension that's visible in the images. The article concludes, though, with the modest expectation that this school ran no risk of producing either des déclassés ou des désenchantés. So we're not going to pull them out of their, um, of their, of their culture, but it's the school should permit good Muslim girls to become uh, the, the wives of cultivated um, husbands, uh, be, so better, uh, better right? uh, in order to um, be in the house uh, and uh, to bring greater charm to the house. So this Tunisian example reminds us of the importance of context, even in closely situated imperial spaces, but it also highlights the circulations and borrowings that operated within these spaces over time. Eigenschenk operated in a world that had considerably changed since the conquest of Algeria in 1830, but I don't think it's far-fetched to see her school as a form of continuum with, Arab, with the Arab-French school inaugurated by Luce in 1845. Finally, and, and more importantly, I think one should note that Arab girls were part of the visual and written discourse about modernity. They weren't relegated to the harem stories that Marilyn Booth has collected, but were also part of school histories, which deserve closer attention. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs>